Welcome to First Baptist Port Charlotte's online media. We hope this message will inspire you to draw nearer to God, connect with His family, and share your faith. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come, and all this is from God. So what old has gone, perished, is no longer true about God's children. Well, before we become Christians, our condition before God is sinful. Would you say that with me? Our condition before God is sinful. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. What's more, before we become Christians, our father is the devil. Say that with me. Our father is the devil. Jesus said, if God was your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I've not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. There's no truth in him. If I'm telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you don't hear is you don't belong to God. And most people believe they belong to God, but Jesus is speaking the truth. What's more, before we become Christians, our destiny is hell. Say that with me. Our destiny is hell. At the final judgment, which will take place, we are told anyone's name who was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So that's the old. It's really bad And no wonder the declaration is thrilling. That old for us is gone. And all that is from God. He brought it to us. He's done that for us. So what new has been brought to us, imparted to us, brought into existence? When you become a Christian, when God saves you, our condition before God is now righteous. Say that with me. Our condition before God is righteous. When God saves you, he takes the righteousness of Jesus Christ and he imputes it to you. So when God looks at you, he sees you clothed with the robe of Jesus' perfect righteousness. That righteousness is given through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. Furthermore, God saves us from our tormenting, enslaving father, the devil, and he adopts us into his family. Our father becomes God. Say that with me. Our father becomes God. And the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship and by him we cry Abba Father so my daughter Joy arrived uh, with her husband Chris and the two grand cud- uh, grandchildren uh, three year old Gus and four month old Marigold and they walked in the front door Shirley opened the door Gus And we ran toward each other, and I embraced him in my arms, and we held, and it was delightful. And I wonder if that boy realizes how much I love him. And sometimes I wonder if we forget how much Father loves us. 
We are the apple of his eye. We're the delight of his heart. He welcomes us into his presence and into his arms. That's the benefit of the new covenant of being adopted, him becoming our father. And furthermore, our eternal home is heaven. Say that with me. Our eternal home is heaven. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So when you are saved by God, that's why Christians are so joyful. My heavens above, that old has gone. God has delivered us from sin, Satan, and hell and brought new things to us. He becomes our father. We become righteous in his sight and he promised us to lead us through this life. And so we're studying the book of Acts the church empowered, and we're seeing people saved. Uh, they're coming into the kingdom, and they're learning how to walk by faith. Some of them came out of Judaism. Others were in pagan religions of performance and fear-based, and now they come into the kingdom of God of grace and mercy, and it's wonderful. And they're learning how to walk and live by faith, and so we're gleaning insight as we study. So continuing from last week, we remember that Barnabas uh, chose John Mark and, uh, and Paul and Silas, and they're going back to the churches where we preached the word of the Lord to see how they were doing. And so that was one of the lessons that we gleaned last week that I want to reiterate this morning. You're learning to move from conversations that are superficial to spiritual. And so don't be conformed. As a Christian now, you talk about Jesus Christ. As a child of God, you talk about God. As one who's destined for heaven, you talk about heaven. People spend their lives talking about how terrible this place is. You spend your life talking about how wonderful heaven is. That's your home, and you're going there, and they can go there as well. So our conversation changes. Our perspective changes. God does this work of grace in us, and it's good. So I hope that you're doing that, that you are having spiritual conversations uh, with your children, with your grandchildren, with your mate, with your friends, uh, doing whatever you can to talk about things of substance because that pleases the Lord. So they're going to go back to the churches and they're going to find out how they're doing spiritually after they preach the word of the Lord to them. So Barnabas takes his new teammate, John Mark, and they head off for Cyprus. And this morning we're reading about Paul and Silas's ministry. And we'll see that today. And then buckle your seatbelts for what we have next week. Let's begin with verse 1. He, that is Paul, came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but his father was a Greek, a Gentile. So they get to Lystra, and God brings Timothy into their lives. Now, Timothy's been chosen by God to go on this journey with them, and he will be of great assistance to them. But remember how Paul and Silas got to Lystra to find Timothy? They took a detour that arose from a disagreement. Barnabas and John Mark, they go off to Cyprus to Asia Minor, so Paul chooses the different way, but God has a plan for that different way. And let me say this, we don't always understand God's detours, but if we will trust him and look for his purposes, we will discover them. So that's lesson number one in your notes. God can use detours to accomplish his divine purposes. Romans 8, 28 is true for Christians. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him. That's us to those who have been called according to his purposes. That's us. And so detours are sometimes God's chosen routes, whether we're driving, walking, or life circumstances, to get us where he wants us to go. So we don't resent the changes. We look for God's plans and purposes in them. So yesterday, Nicholas called. Nicholas is my fifth born, and he's going to seminary in Louisville, and uh, he was driving to Orlando to see Jason and then do a ministry and then head back to school. 
And uh, so he called, he had a flat tire going through Tennessee. And so mom got on the phone and, uh, and so she's talking and he's on the side of the road and we said, okay, so rather than complain, what can you thank God for? Oh, I can thank God for AAA. That's good. You can. And can you thank God for whatever purposes that he has? Yes, I can. Good. Now you wait on the Lord and you make the most of your time. And so that went good. A couple hours later, he called, had a second flat tire. He said, okay, this is a little harder now because I'm on the side of the road. I've been waiting for AAA. They got the information wrong. Now my battery's dead. Now my phone is going dead. And I'm just concerned. He said, okay, so what do you have to be thankful for? Well, I'm thankful that I'm alive. And I'm thankful for AAA again. And, uh, and I said, okay, so what might be... See, we have these spiritual conversations with people, don't we? Okay, what might be God's purposes in that? Okay, you're going to get in a uh, vehicle with a guy that's going to come and tow you and whatever, so be alert. God might have engineered circumstances to get you in his life. And so after the interaction, he goes, wow, I had a chance to minister to the man. Oh, you know, God sometimes uses detours to get people into our life that, that we not, might not normally see or talk with. And so rather than resenting the changes and always living ticked off that things aren't going the way we want them, because most of the time they don't, we learn to see for God, look for God's hand. We learn to believe that he has a purpose and a plan and we want to discover it. So as our new way of life, we look at things very differently don't we? And so if you ever meet a believer that's stuck in the old way of life, of always getting miffed because of some change or something didn't work out, you begin to teach them to see things in a new way, that God has purposes and a plan even for the detours of life. You take Old Testament Joseph. How would God get young Joseph to a place of influence so he could save a nation of people? Well, the journey meant slavery and imprisonment. But God was with Joseph, and he used the difficulties to mature him as a man of faith. It was like God's seminary training. And in God's timing, he took him from prisoner to prime minister, second in command in the land. And then he equipped him to know what was coming, to save the food and store it, and he saved a nation from starvation. And then he saved the very brothers that sold him into slavery. He forgave them. He was restored to them. And the journey is far different than what he would have chosen. But can I just say this? You and I have the same journey, just different circumstances. God allows difficulties into our lives. He allows detours, and he's going to use them for his purposes so we don't resent them. So Paul and Silas go off on their missionary journey. They go to Lystra. They find God's provision of Timothy as a prepared teammate for them. Verse 2, the brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of Timothy. Paul wanted to take him along the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek or a Gentile. So Timothy has this unique heritage. His mother was Jew. His father was Greek or Gentile. So what likely happened was that the Jews rejected Timothy because he wasn't circumcised. His father was a Gentile. And the Gentiles likely rejected him because his mother was a Jew. If only he had a different mother. If only he had a different father. But wait, what if God could take that and use it in a unique way? Because now he could relate to the Jews because he was half Jew, and he could relate to the Gentiles because he was half Gentile. Oh my word, he could be the perfectly prepared missionary to join Paul and Silas because he had a point of identification with both groups. And so that's lesson number two. Don't resent your past. Find God's purposes in it. What likely caused Timothy heartache as a child would eventually be used for God's purposes and glory. 
And so we don't resent where we've come from. Uh, you may have had a life experience in your past that God can take and use you to identify with someone who has the same life experience. And when you share your testimony, your life story, God uses it to convey hope. I was reading in World Magazine this week about Johnny Erickson Tata. 50 years ago, as a 17-year-old, she jumped into a lake, but she didn't realize it was shallow. She broke her neck, and she's been in a wheelchair for 50 years this year. She's been a paraplegic. Rather than resenting for the God who allowed it or feeling sorry for herself, she has matured as a woman of faith, and God has used her to develop a worldwide ministry. Johnny and Friends provides family retreats, spiritual refreshment for families who have a child with a disability. Wheels of the World provides thousands of wheelchairs in underdeveloped countries. Uh, she's written books read by millions. She's a conference speaker, and she captivates audiences with true life stories of her faith and perseverance. She sings. She has a movie about her life. Her ministry educates Christians and churches and how best to minister to those with disabilities. She told World, World Magazine, God had a plan for my life. He didn't cause the accident, but he didn't stop it. Instead, he's used it to lead thousands to faith in Christ and give hope to people around the world. So let me tell you, if God allows something difficult or devastating, look for his purposes and plans in them. So you go back to our text. The one challenge that Timothy would face in order to be accepted by the Jews was that he wasn't circumcised. So if he's going to go on this missionary journey and go into the temple, he can't go into the temple unless he's circumcised. And so Paul circumcised him. But that leads to lesson number three. The gospel deserves our sacrifices. There are times when we will sacrifice what we want to do because there is an opportunity to minister. There are times that we will put the Lord before ourselves. We'll be called to do that. There will be times that we'll be invited to sacrificially give to the kingdom. Can I say thank you for those of you that gave supplies to Benny and Dominique Guerriere, our missionaries in Haiti? And uh, the supplies arrived in Ocala. They got to Lake Worth. The bus and all the school supplies are making their way now to Haiti. And I got the email from Dominique this morning uh, thanking her. She's such a gracious woman. Uh, thanking all who gave uh, to help them there in the school that they have there in Haiti. We're appreciative to them. Uh, this week, Grant and Jody Waller arrived in town. Uh, they're actually on vacation for a few days, but they'll be back. And they're going to spend this fall with us. Uh, they're going to live with her parents, uh, Craig and Cindy Birch. Uh, Grant's going to help us on staff. He said, I'd like to plug into the church and find ways to minister for the five months that we're here. So while they're here on furlough as our international missionaries, uh, they're gonna, you're going to see them around, and they're going to plug into ministry. We're going to allow their children to go to our school for free because they are missionaries, and we want to support them. They serve in a very remote area on the island of Madagascar. Their conditions are primitive. They have sacrificed the luxuries of the American lifestyle. They live far away from loved ones. They live on a meager income. It is hot, it is hard, and it is often a heavy toll to pay. But as he will tell you when you hear him speak at our mission fest this fall, the gospel is worth it. God is worth it. When we consider what Jesus Christ did for us, we are willing to go. We are willing to sacrifice for the kingdom. So will you be inconvenienced for the sake of the gospel? Timothy went through the painful ordeal of circumcision so that he would be accepted by the Jews. And God will lead you in certain ways in your life so that you can be sensitive to those who do not know the Lord. Verse 4, as they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. And so that's lesson four. Learn to teach people what God's word has to say. This morning, I hope that you're listening, not just for your own benefit, 
but because there might be someone who needs to hear this and you are God's chosen vessel to tell them. You're going to see them on Facebook and you're going to be led to tell them what you have learned from God's word. And it's not just your opinion. It's what God has to say. We learn God's word so that we can faithfully impart it to others. I remember there had been confusion about salvation. Uh, how is a person saved? Do they have to be circumcised in order to be saved? And uh, the decision went to the apostles and elders, and they said, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. We are not saved, but because what, of what we have done or what we will do, we are saved because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. It was enough. It's a finished work, and that's where our faith lies in the grace of the Lord that has been extended to us. So they're preaching this, and they're reminding the people of what the Word of God teaches. And what's the result? These people are strengthened. That word means to solidify, to make strong, stable, secure. And so we speak the Word of the Lord to our children and grandchildren. We speak the Word of the Lord to others, reminding them what the Word of God has to say. We learn to do that. Why do we do that? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And so we impart the word and people's faith is strengthened in the Lord. One thing that's consistent about life is change. If you put your hope in things that can be changed, um, you will find yourself unstable and unsettled. But when you put your faith in the Lord who does not change and in his word which endures forever, you will find a stability for your life. Isn't that what we want for our children and for our own lives and for the church is for them to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And that comes as they read the word of the Lord. Verse 6, Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. Now, did you see the pattern there? First of all, let me say, the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Jesus, that is God the Holy Spirit being referred to. And notice the wording. It reminds you that when you got saved, there's a new way you live. You don't just by live by your own natural instincts. You now live by the Spirit. God lives within you. He speaks to you. He prompts you. He leads you. He withholds you back. He empowers you forth. And you learn to live the Spirit-filled, Spirit-led life. And it's a glorious life. And so I put that down. Notice the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't allow them, kept them. And so that's lesson five. Learn to be led by God's Spirit. Write that down. Learn to be led, number five, by God's Spirit. The Holy Spirit will prompt you. Uh, he has, it's a still, small voice, and so he'll put thoughts on your mind that you wouldn't have thought, and you realize that is God speaking to you, God leading you, God prompting you. Uh, you'll have a caution about something, and you realize, I shouldn't go there. I shouldn't do that. You'll be convicted when you do wrong, and you realize you need to confess and repent and apologize. It's a new way to live. It's really a great adventure. And so you learn to stop living in the flesh, and you learn to walk in the Spirit. And that's what you see these people doing, and it really is great. So recently, I needed to wash my upstairs windows. I have a two-story house, and, um, and I hadn't washed them in 11 years that I've lived there. And they look kind of green, and I knew they needed, so I went to the store and got the spray. You see, spray it up there, and then you get a pole, and I didn't want to get on a ladder, and so I could reach it, but I realized the screen was on it. So I, oh, how do I get the screen down? So I can get it down from the inside. So I walked inside, so I walked through the kitchen, walked through the living room, walked up the 17 stairs, I walked down the hall, walked in the bedroom, got over to the window, and pulled the screen off. And after I pulled it off, I looked back, and I went, what is that little brown blob there on the floor? In fact, every other step is a brown blob of, really? I don't 
don't even have a dog. <laughs> and sure enough, every other step, all the way, every other stair, all the way, stair step, all the way down the tile to the back door, there were little blobs of dog manure. <laughs> Shirley happened to be home. I said, honey, put on the praise music. <laughs> because I'm tempted with a bad attitude. I thought I was going to clean windows. Now I'm going to clean carpet. <laughs> and so, in my weakness, the Lord helped me. First of all, I don't like things like that. And so that just made it even harder. But then just the idea that I was going to do one thing and now I'm distracted and because of my neighbor's dog because they won't clean up after him. And he just enjoys going in my yard. Whatever. And... Um, <laughs> So I'm on my hands and knees cleaning carpet. There's something good about being on your hands and knees. Did you know that? It's just good. I'm on my hands and knees, and a thought comes, these neighbors, yeah, that are on my seven for heaven list. I'm praying for them to come to Christ. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not, I forgive them in Jesus' name. Whatever. And um, so I forgave them, and then the music's coming. I'm worshiping. So I'll mind he's worshiping. And I, you know, it is what it is. This happens to other people all the time. Stop being such a baby and just do it. Take, you know, and so I'm talking to myself and just, and, and by the grace of God, I got it all done and, and uh, moved on and then just moved on with my life. And I looked over, and there's my neighbors. And the Spirit of the Lord, here's what I heard, lay it down. Lay it down. Really? You're going to be that guy? Hey, your dog, an idea. Really? You're trying to win them to Jesus. You're going to put up a barrier when you need a bridge? And the Spirit of the Lord gave me grace and in those moments prompted me, don't Maybe at some point, not now, because you're too miffed. Don't say anything. Close your mouth, but then reach up. Hey, how are you today? With a smile. And you know what? I do love them. I do care about them. I do want to see them come to Christ. And so it's far more important. What's on my carpet isn't, my carpet is not important about as their soul. So in my new way of life, have I gotten over what's not important and really begin to focus on what's most important? The Lord helps us do that. The Spirit helps us. So he prompted me, and I could honestly be joyful, have a conversation, express kindness, and just forget it and move on. You say, wow, you're amazing. No, the Lord is amazing. He helped me because I was tempted. And that's what he does. He helps us. It's a new way of living for us. And so as we go through this book of Acts, it's my prayers that each week as we learn these lessons that we'll apply them to our lives so that we'll realize, okay, well, that, that's the old. I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. Why does anybody need a piece of my mind? What they need is the Lord. They need the mind of Christ. So stop and start and begin to walk in new ways, it's a great adventure.